The Princess of Ellis by Molière, translated by Henri Van Lone, 1820 to 1896. First interlude. Scene one, Aurora. When love presents a charming choice, respond to his flame, O youthful fair. Do not affect a pride which no one can subdue, though you've been told such pride becomes you well. When one is of a lovely age, not as so handsome as to love. Breathe freely sighs for him who faithful loves, and challenge those who wish to blame your ways. A tender heart is lovely, but a cruel maid will never be a title to esteem. When one is fair and beautiful, not as so handsome as to love. Scene 2. Whippers in and Musicians Whilst Aurora was singing these verses, four whippers in were asleep on the grass, one of whom, called Lysiscus, represented by Monsieur de Molière, an excellent actor who had invented the verses and the whole comedy, was lying between two whilst the third was at his feet. The other huntsmen were Messrs. Estevel, Don and Blondel, musicians of the king, who had admirable voices, and who awoke at Aurora's call, and, as soon as she had finished, sang in recitativo. Hello, hello, get up, get up, get up. Get up. Everything must be prepared for the hunting match. Hello, get up, get up quickly. Day to the darkest spots imparts its light. The air distills its pearls on flowers. The nightingales begin their warbling notes, and with their little concerts thrill the air. Come, come, come get, get up, up quick, quick, get, get up. up. To Lysiscus, asleep. What, what is the matter, Lysiscus? What, you're snoring still? You, who promised to outstrip Aurora? Come, get up, get up quick. Everything must be prepared for the hunting match. Get up, get up quickly, quickly, get, get up. up, make, make haste. haste, get, get up. up. Lysiscus, waking. <sighs> Sounds, you are terrible, Paul, as you open your throats early in the morning. Do you, Do you not see the light beams everywhere? everywhere? Come, Come, get, get up, up Lysiscus, Lysiscus. Get, 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 get up. Oh, let me sleep yet a little while, I entreat you. No, no, no get, get up, up. Get Lysiscus, Lysiscus, get, get up. up. I only ask about a quarter of an hour. Not, not at, at all, not, not at, at all. Get up, get up. up. quick, get, get up. up. Alas, I pray you. Get, get up. up. A moment. Get, get up. up. I beseech you. Get, get up. Oh. Get, get up. up. I. Get, get up. I shall have done immediately. No, 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 get up, get up, get up. Get up. Get up. Everything, Everything has to be prepared, prepared for the hunting, the hunting match. match. Quickly, Quickly, get, get up. up, make haste, get, get up. up. Well, be quiet, I shall advise. You are strange people to torment me thus. You will be the cause of my being unwell all day. For do you see, sleep is necessary to man. And when one does not sleep, one's fill. It happens that one is not. He falls asleep again. Lysiscus. 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 To the juice with these brawlers. I wish your throats were stopped with scalding porridge. Get, get up, up, get, get up. up. Make haste, get, get up, up. Quick, quick, get, get up. up. Oh, how wearisome not to sleep one's fill. So ho ho. So ho ho. So ho ho. So ho ho. Ho 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 ho. Plague take the fellows with their howlings. May the devil take them if I do not give you a good drubbing for this. But what juiced enthusiasm possesses them to come and cast a wall in my ears at this rate? Get, Get up. up. Again? Get, Get up. The devil take you. Get, Get up. Lysiscus getting up. What? Again? Was there ever such a passion for singing? Sounds I shall go mad. Since I am disturbed, I will not let the others sleep. I shall torment them as they have done me. Come, so ho, gentlemen, get up, get up, quick. You have been sleeping too long. I shall make a devil of a noise everywhere. He shouts with all his might. Get up, get up, get up. Come quick, so ho, get up, get up. Everything must be prepared for the hunt. Get up, get up, Lysicius. Get up, so ho, 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 ho. Lysiscus, having at length risen with the greatest difficulty and having shouted as loud as he could, 
several horns and hunting horns are blown, which, together with the violins, begin an entree tune, to which six whippers in dance with great precision and order, whilst winding their horns at certain periods. Act One, Argument This hunt was prepared by the Prince of Ellis, who, being of a gallant and magnificent disposition, and desirous that the princess, his daughter, would think of marriage, to which he was very much averse, had invited to his court the princes of Ithaca, Messina, and Pylos, thinking that, whilst hunting, which she loved very much, or during other sports, chariot races, and the like displays, one of these princes might perhaps please her, and so become her husband. Scene 1. Euryalus, Prince of Ithaca, in love with the Princess of Alice. Arbates, his governor, who, indulgent to the prince's passion, praises him in elegant phraseology, instead of blaming him. Euryalus, Arbates. This dreamy silence, to which you have accustomed yourself so dolefully, makes you continually seek solitude. Those deep sighs which come from your heart, and that gaze so full of languor, certainly say much to one of my age. I believe, my lord, I understand the language, but, for fear of running too great a risk, I dare not be so bold as to explain it without your leave. Explain, explain, with all freedom, Arbates, these sighs, these looks, and this mournful silence. I give you leave to say that love has subjected me to its laws, and defies me in its turn. I farther admit that you make me ashamed of the weaknesses of a heart, which suffers itself to be overcome. What, my lord? Shall I blame you for the tender emotions with which I now see you inspired? The sourness of old age cannot embitter me against the gentle transports of an amorous flame. Although my life is near its close, I maintain that love suits well such men as you that the tribute paid to the charms of a beautiful face is a clear proof of a beautiful mind, and that it is not easy for a young prince to be great and generous without being in love. It is a quality I admire in a monarch. Tenderness of heart is a sure sign that everything may be expected from a prince of your age as soon as we perceive that his soul is capable of love. Yes, that passion, the most beautiful of all others, draws a hundred virtues in its train. It urges the heart to noble deeds and all great heroes have felt its ardour. Your infancy, my lord, was spent under my eyes. I have seen realised the expectations formed from your virtues. I observed in you qualities which told of the blood from which you sprung. I discovered in you a fund of wit and brightness. I found you handsome, great, and noble. Your courage and your abilities shone forth every day. But I was concerned because I did not perceive any traces of love. Now that the pangs of an incurable wound show that your soul is insensible to its strokes, I triumph, and my heart, full of joy, looks upon you as a finished prince. If, for a time, I defied the power of love, alas, my dear Arbates, it takes ample vengeance for it now. If you knew the 
ills into which my heart is plunged, you yourself would wish that it had never loved. For this is the fate that awaits me. I love. I ardently love the princess of Ellis. You know that that pride which lurks beneath her charming aspect arms her youthful sentiments against love and that she avoids during this grand feast the crowd of lovers who strive to obtain her hand. Alas, how little truth is there in the saying that the being we love charms us at first sight, and that the first glance kindles in us those flames to which heaven at our birth destined our souls. On my return from Argos, I passed this way, and then saw the princess. I beheld all the charms with which she is endowed, but looked on them as one would look on a fine statue. Her brilliant youth, which I observed carefully, did not inspire my soul with one secret desire. I quietly returned to the shores of Ithaca without so much as recalling her to my mind for two years. In the meantime, the rumor spread to my court that she was known to entertain a contempt for love. It was published everywhere that her proud spirit had an unconquerable aversion to marriage, and that with a bow in her hand and a quiver on her shoulder she roamed through the woods like another Diana, loved nothing but hunting, and caused all the young heroes of Greece to sigh in vain. Admire our tempers and fate. What her presence and beauty failed to do, the fame of her boldness produced in my heart. An unknown transport was born within me which I could not master. Her disdain so bruited about had a secret charm which made me carefully call to remembrance all her features. Looking upon her with new eyes, I formed an image of her so noble, so beautiful, picturing to myself so much glory and such pleasures, if I could but triumph over her coldness, that my heart dazzled by such a victory saw its glorious liberty fade away. It in vain resisted such a bait. The sweetness of it took such complete possession of my senses that, impelled by an invisible power, I sailed at once from Ithaca hither, concealing my ardent passion under the pretense of wishing to be present at these renowned sports, to which the illustrious Iphitus, father of the princess, has invited most of the princes of Greece. But of what use, my lord, are the precautions you take? And why are you so anxious to keep it a secret? You love this illustrious princess, you say, and come to signalize yourself before her. Yet neither looks, words, nor sighs have informed her of your ardent passion. I cannot for my part understand this policy, which will not allow you to open your heart. Nor do I see what fruit can be expected of a love which avoids all modes of discovering itself. And what should I gain, Arbates, by avowing my pangs, but draw down on myself the disdain of her haughty soul, and throw myself into the rank of those submissive princes, whose title of lovers causes her to look on them as enemies? You see the kings of Messina and Pylos in vain lay their hearts at her feet. The lofty splendor of their virtues, accompanied by the most assiduous respect, is useless. This repulse of their homage makes me conceal in sad silence the warmth of my love. I account myself condemned in seeing her behavior towards these famous rivals, and read my own sentence in the contempt she shows to them. And it is in this contempt and haughty humor that your love should see its brightest hope since fortune presents to you a heart to conquer, which is defended only by mere coldness, and does not oppose to your passion the deep-rooted tenderness for some other engagement. 
a heart already occupied resists powerfully but when the soul is free it is easily overcome and only a little patience is needed to triumph over all the pride of indifference conceal no longer from her the influence which her eyes have upon you openly display your passion and far from trembling at the example of others fortify yourself with the hope that you will be successful because they have been repulsed perhaps you may possess the secret of touching her obdurate heart which these princes have not and if through her imperious and capricious pride you should not meet with a more propitious destiny it is at least a happiness in misfortunes of this kind to see one's rivals rejected with oneself i'm glad to find that you approve a declaration of my passion by combating my reasons you delight my soul I wish to see by what I said whether you could approve what I had done. In short, since I must take you into my confidence, there is one who is to explain my silence to the princess. And perhaps, at the very moment I am talking to you here, the secret of my heart is revealed. This chase, to which she went, you know, this morning early, in order to avoid the crowd of her adorers, is the opportunity which Moron has chosen to declare my passion. Moron, my lord? My choice rather astonishes you. You misjudge him because he is a court fool. But you must know that he is less a fool than he wishes to appear, and that notwithstanding his present employment, he has more sense than those who laugh at him. The princess amuses herself with his buffooneries. He has obtained her favor by a hundred jests, and can thus say and persuade her to what others dare not hazard. In short, I think him fit for my purpose. He says he has a great affection for me, and having been born in my country, will assist my love against all rivals. A little money given him to sustain his zeal. Scene 2. Moron, represented by Monsieur de Moliere arrives and being haunted by the remembrance of a furious wild boar before which he had taken flight in the chase asks for assistance meeting with euryalus and arbates he places himself between them for greater safety after having given proofs of his terror and cracked a hundred jokes about his want of courage euryalus arbates moron moron behind the scenes Help! Help! Save me from this cruel animal! I think I hear his voice. Come to me! For mercy's sake, come to me! It is he! Where is he running in such a fright? Moron, appearing without seeing anyone. How shall I avoid this frightful boar? Ye gods, preserve me from his horrid tusks, and I promise you, if he does not catch me, Four pounds of incense and two of the fattest calves. Meeting Euryalus, whom in his fright he takes for the boar from which he is flying. Oh, I am dead. What ails you? Oh, I took you for the animal, whose throat I beheld ready to swallow me. My lord, I could not recover from my fright. What is it? Oh, what a strange taste the princess has and in following the chase and her extravagances, what foolishness we must put up with. What pleasure can these hunters find in being exposed to many thousand terrors? Now, if a man hunted only hares, rabbits, or young does, it would be sensible. They are animals of a very gentle nature and always run away from us. But to go and attack these unmannerly beasts, who have not the least respect for a human face, and who hunt those who come to hunt them... That is a foolish pastime I cannot endure. Tell us, what is the matter? Moron, turning round. 
What a whim of the princess to take exercise under such difficulties. I could have sworn she would play this trick. As the chariot race came on today, she must needs go hunt to show her open contempt for these sports, and to make it appear... But, Mum, let me finish my tale and resume the thread of my discourse. What was I saying? You were talking of an exercise under difficulties. Ah, yes. Well, then, fainting under this horrible labor, for I was up at break of day, fitted out like a famous hunter, I slunk away from them all like a hero, and, finding a good place to take a nap in, I laid me down, and, composing myself, already began to snore comfortably, when suddenly a frightful noise made me open my eyes, and I beheld, coming out from behind an old thicket of the leafy wood, a boar of enormous size for... What now? Nothing. Do not be afraid. But let me get between you, for a reason. I may then be better able to tell you the whole thing. I was saying I beheld the boar, which, being pursued by our people, set up all his bristles with a hideous air. His glaring eyes darted only threats. His mouth, with an ugly grin, showed through the foam certain tusks for those who ventured near him. I leave you to imagine it. At this terrible sight I seized my weapons. But the treasurer's brute, without the slightest fear, rushed straight at me without my speaking a word to him. And you stood your ground? I was not such a fool. I threw down my arms and ran like a dozen. What? Having weapons and yet fly from a boar? That is not a valiant action, moron. I confess it was not valiant, but sensible. But if one does not immortalize oneself by some exploit... I am your servant. I had rather people would say, It was here that moron, by flying without much pressure, saved himself from the fury of a wild boar than that they should say, here is the famous spot where the brave moron, with heroic boldness facing the furious rush of a wild boar, lost his life by a wound from his tusk. Very good. Yes. Without offense to glory, I would rather live two days in the world than a thousand years in history. Your death would indeed grieve your friends. But if your mind has recovered from its fright... May I inquire of the passion which consumes me? My lord, I will not dissemble with you. I have done nothing yet, not having had the opportunity to speak with the princess as I desired. The office of court buffoon has its prerogatives, but we must often turn aside from our free attempts. To talk of your flame is a delicate matter. It is a state matter with the princess. You know in what title she glories, and that her brain is full of a philosophy which wars against marriage and treats Cupid as a minor god. I must manage the thing skillfully for fear of arousing her tiger humor. One must be careful how to speak to great folks, for they are very ticklish sometimes. Let me manage it by degrees. I am full of zeal for you. I was born your subject." Some other obligations may also contribute to the happiness I design for you. My mother was esteemed handsome in her day, and was not naturally cruel. That generous prince, your late father, was dangerously gallant, and I have heard that Elpinor, supposed to be my father because he was my mother's husband, related to the shepherds that he was occasionally honored by a visit from the prince and that, during that time, he had the advantage of being bowed to by all the village. That is sufficient. Be that as it may, I intend by my labors... But here is the princess and two of your rivals. Scene 3. The princess of Alice appears afterwards with the princes of Messina and Pylos, who show that their characters are very different from that of the prince of Ithaca, 
which procured for him in the heart of the princess all the advantages he could desire this amiable princess did not show however that the merit of this prince had made any impression on her mind or that she had so much as observed him she always professed that like diana she only loved the chase and the forests and when the prince of messina wished to mention the service he had rendered her by rescuing her from a huge boar which had attacked her she told him that without diminishing in aught her gratitude she considered his assistance so much the less considerable as she unaided had killed many as furious and might perhaps have overcome that one the princess aglanta cynthia aristomenes theocles euryalus phyllis arbates moron do you upbraid us madam for saving your charms from this peril for my part i should have thought that to overcome the boar which was about to attack you so furiously was an adventure not knowing of the hunt for which we ought to have thanked our happy fate but by your coldness i see plainly that i ought to be of another opinion and quarrel with that fatal power of chance which made me take part in an affair that has given you offence for my part madam i esteem myself very happy in having performed this action for which my whole heart was anxious and notwithstanding your displeasure cannot consent to blame fortune for such an adventure i know that when one is disliked everything one does displeases but even were your anger greater than it is it is an extreme pleasure when one's love is extreme to be able to rescue from peril the object of one's love and do you think my lord since i must speak that there would have been anything in this danger to terrify me so greatly that the bow and arrow which i love so much would have been a useless weapon in my hands and that i accustomed to traverse our mountains our plains our woods might not dare hope to suffice for my own defence surely i have made but little use of my time and the assiduous labours of which i boast if in such an emergency i could not have triumphed over a wretched animal at least if in your opinion my sex in general is unable for such actions allow me the glory of a higher sphere and do me the favour both of you to believe that whatever the boar of to-day may have been i have conquered fiercer ones without your help my lords but madam well be it so i see that your desire is to show me that i owe my life to you i grant it yes without you i had lost my life i heartily thank you for your grand assistance and will go at once to the prince to inform him of the kindness with which your love has inspired you for me scene four euryalus arbates moron well was there ever seen such an untamed spirit the well-timed death of that ugly boar vexes her oh how willingly would i have rewarded any one who would have rid me of him just now arbates to euryalus i see my lord her disdain renders you pensive but it ought not to retard in the least the execution of your plans her hour must come and perhaps it is to you that the honour of conquering her is reserved she must know of your passion before the race and i no moron i do not wish it so any longer be careful to say nothing and leave me to act i have resolved to take quite a different course i see plainly she is resolved to despise all who think to gain her heart by deep respect and the deity who induces me to sigh for her has inspired me with a new way to conquer her yes it is he who has caused this sudden change and from him I await its happy conclusion. May one know, my lord, by what means you hope? You shall see it. Follow me and keep silence. End of Act One Second Interlude Argument 
The agreeable moron leaves the prince to go and talk of his growing passion to the woods and rocks, uttering everywhere the beautiful name of his shepherdess Phyllis. A ridiculous echo answers him whimsically. He takes so great a pleasure in it that, laughing in a hundred ways, he makes the echo answer as often without seeming at all tired of it. But a bear interrupts this fine amusement and surprises him so much by the unexpected sight that he shows visible signs of terror which causes him to make before the bear all the bows he can think of to mollify him. At length he is going to run up a tree, but seeing that the bear is also going to climb, he cries out for help so loudly that eight peasants, armed with pointed sticks and spears, appear, whilst another bear comes after the first. A battle then begins, which ends with the death of one of the bears and the flight of the other. Scene 1. Moron. Alone. Goodbye, till I see you again. As for me, I shall stay here and have a little conversation with these trees and rocks. Woods, meadows, fountains, flowers, that behold my pale countenance, if you do not know it, I tell you, I am in love. Phyllis is the charming object who has fixed my heart. I became her lover by seeing her milk a cow, her fingers quite full of milk and a thousand times whiter, squeezed the udder in an admirable manner. Oh, the thought of it will drive me crazy. Ah, oh, Phyllis, Phyllis. Echo. Phyllis. Ah, ah, um, um, ah, ah, oh, 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 oh. This is a funny echo. Home. This is a funny echo. Scene 2. A Bear, Moron Moron, seeing a bear approaching. Oh, Master Bear, I am your very humble servant. Pray, spare me. I assure you I am not worth eating. I am only skin and bone, and... I see certain people yonder who would serve your turn much better. Eh, hey, hey, eh, my lord, uh, gently if you please. There. He caresses the bear and trembles with fear. There, there, there. Ah, oh, my lord, how handsome and well made your highness is. You look quite stylish, and you have the prettiest shape in the world. Oh, what beautiful bristles! What a beautiful head! What beautiful sparkling and large eyes! Ah, what a pretty little nose! What a pretty little mouth! What darling little teeth! Ah, what a beautiful throat! What beautiful little paws! What well-shaped little nails! The bear gets on his hind legs. Help! Help! I am dead! Have mercy! Poor moron! Oh, good heavens! Oh, quick! I am lost! The huntsmen appear, and moron climbs up a tree. He addresses the huntsmen. Oh, gentlemen, take pity upon me. The huntsmen fight with the bear. That is right, gentlemen. Kill that ugly beast for me. Assist them, kind heaven. All right, he runs away. There he stops and falls upon them. 
That is right. There is one who has given him a thrust to the throat. They all surround him. Courage, stand to it. Well done, my friends. That is right. Go on, again. Oh, there he is, on the ground. It is all over with him. He is dead. Let us come down now and give him a hundred blows. Moron comes down the tree. Your servant, gentlemen. I am much obliged to you for having delivered me from this animal. Now that you have killed him, I am going to finish him and triumph with you. These fortunate huntsmen had no sooner gained this victory than Moron, grown bold by the danger being remote, wishes to go and give a thousand blows to the animal, no longer able to defend himself, and does all that a braggart not overbold would have done on such an occasion. The huntsmen, to show their joy, dance a very fine entree. Act Two, Argument the Prince of Ithaca and the Princess had a very gallant conversation about the chariot race which was in preparation. She had ere this told one of the princesses, her relatives, that the insensibility of the Prince of Ithaca disturbed her, and was disagreeable to her, that although she did not wish to love any one, it was very sad to see that he loved nothing, and that, although she had resolved not to go to see the races, she now would go, in order to endeavour to triumph over the liberty of a man who was so fond of it. It might easily be perceived that the merit of this prince produced its ordinary effect, that his fine qualities had touched her proud heart, and had begun partly to thaw that ice which had resisted until then all the ardour of love. Advised by Moron, whom he had gained over, and who knew well the heart of the princess, the more the prince pretended to be insensible, although he was but too much in love, the more the princess resolved to win his affections, though she did not intend to return his love. The princes of Messina and Pylos took their leave of her, to go to prepare for the races, and spoke of the expectation they had of being conquerors, because they desired to please her. The prince of Ithaca, on the contrary, told her that, having never been in love with anything, he was going to try to obtain the prize for his own satisfaction. This made the princess all the more anxious to subdue a heart, already sufficiently subdued, but which knew how to disguise its sentiments in a wonderful manner. Scene 1. The Princess, Aglanta, Cynthia, Phyllis Yes, I love to dwell in these peaceful spots, there is nothing here but what enchants the eye, and all the noble architecture of our palaces must yield the palm to these simple beauties formed by nature. These trees, these rocks, these waters, this fresh turf, have charms for me of which I never tire. Like you, I love tranquil retreats where one avoids the bustle of the city. Such places are adorned with a thousand charming objects, and what is surprising is that at the very gates of Elis, those gentle souls who hate a crowd may find so vast and beautiful a solitude. But to tell you the truth, in these days of rejoicing your retreat here appears somewhat unseasonable, and puts a slight on the magnificent preparations made by each prince for the public entertainment. The grand spectacle of the chariot race merits the honour of your notice. What right have they to desire my presence, and what do I owe, after all, to their magnificence? They take these pains on purpose to win me, and my heart is the only prize for which they all strive. But with whatever hope they may flatter themselves, I am greatly mistaken if either of them carries it off. How long will this heart be provoked at the innocent designs which are formed to touch it? and regard the trouble which people give themselves as so many offences against your person. I know that in pleading the cause of love I am exposed to your displeasure, but as I have the honour to be related to you, I oppose myself to the harshness which you show, and cannot feed by flattery your resolution of never loving. Is anything more beautiful than the innocent flame which brilliant merit kindles in the soul? What happiness would there be in life if love were banished from among mortals? 
No, no, the delights which it affords are infinite. And to live without loving is, properly speaking, not to live at all. For my part, I think that this passion is the most agreeable business of life, that in order to live happily it is necessary to love, and that all pleasures are insipid unless mangled with a little love. Can you too, being what you are, talk thus? And ought you not to blush for countenancing a passion which is nothing but error, weakness, and extravagance, and of which all the disorders are so repugnant to the glory of our sex? I intend to maintain its honour until the last moment of my life, and will never trust those men who pretend to be our slaves, only to become in time our tyrants. All these tears, all these sighs, all this homage, all these respects, are but snares laid for our hearts, and which often induce them to act basely. For my part, when I behold certain examples, and the hideous meannesses to which that passion can debase persons who are under its sway, my whole heart is moved. I cannot bear that a soul which possesses ever so little pride should not feel horribly ashamed of such weaknesses. Ah, oh, madam, there are certain weaknesses that are not at all shameful, and which it is beautiful to have in the highest degree of glory. I hope that one day you will change your mind, and, if heaven please, we shall shortly see your heart. Hold. Do not finish that strange wish. I have too unconquerable a horror of such debasement. If I should ever be capable of sinking so low, I should certainly never forgive myself. Take care, madam. Love knows how to revenge herself for the contempt shown him. No, no. I defy all his darts. The great power which is attributed to him is nothing but an idle fancy, and an excuse for feeble hearts, who represent him as invincible, to justify their weakness. But all the world recognizes his power, and you see that the gods themselves are subject to his empire. We are told that Jupiter loved more than once, and that Diana herself, whom you so much affect to imitate, was not ashamed to breathe sighs of love. Public opinions are always mixed with error. The gods are not such as the vulgar make them out to be, and it is a want of respect to attribute to them human frailties. Scene 2. The Princess, Aglanta, Cynthia, Phyllis, Moron. Come hither, Moron. Come, help us to defend love against the princess's opinion. Your side is strengthened by a great defender, truly. Upon my word, madam, I believe that after my example there is no more to be said and that none should doubt any longer the power of love. I, for a long time, defied his arms, and acted like a rogue, just as any other. But at length my pride was cowed, and you have a traitress, pointing to Phyllis, who has made me tamer than a lamb. After that, you ought to have no scruples to love, and since I have submitted to him, others may do the same. What? More on in love? Yes, indeed. And is he beloved? And why not? Am I not well enough made for that? I think this face is passable enough, and as to elegant manners... Thank heaven, we yield to none. Without doubt, it would be wrong to. Scene 3. The Princess, Aglanta, Cynthia, Moron, Phyllis, Lycus. Madam, the prince, your father, is coming hither to seek you. He brings with him the princes of Pelos, of Ithaca, and of Messina. Heavens, what does he mean by bringing them to me? Has he resolved on my ruin, and would he force me to choose one of them? Scene 4. Iphitas, Euryalus, Aristomenes, Theocles, the Princess, Aglanta, Cynthia, Phyllis, Moron. Princess to Iphitas. My lord, I beg you to give me leave to prevent, by two words, 
the declaration of the thoughts which you may perhaps foster. There are two truths, my lord, the one as certain as the other, of which I can assure you. The one is that you have an absolute power over me, and that you can lay no command upon me which I would not blindly obey. The other is that I look upon marriage as death, and that it is impossible for me to conquer this natural aversion. To give me a husband and to kill me are the same thing. But your will takes precedence, and my obedience is dearer to me than life. After this, my lord, speak. Say freely what you desire. Daughter, you are wrong to be so alarmed, and I am grieved that you can think me so bad a father as to do violence to your sentiments, and to use tyrannically the power which heaven has given me over you. I wish, indeed, that your heart were capable of loving someone all my desires would be satisfied if that were to happen and i propose to celebrate the present fates and sports only to assemble all the illustrious youth of greece that amongst them you might meet one who would please you and determine your choice i say I ask of heaven no other happiness than to see you married. To obtain this favour, I have this morning again offered up sacrifice to Venus, and if I know how to interpret the language of the gods, the goddess promised me a miracle. But be this as it may, I will act like a father who loves his daughter. If you can find one on whom to fix your inclination, your choice shall be mine, and I shall consider neither interests of state nor advantages of alliance. If your heart remains insensible, I shall not attempt to force it but at least be polite in answer to the civilities offered to you and do not oblige me to make excuses for your coldness treat these princes with the esteem which you owe them and receive with gratitude the proofs of their zeal come and see this race in which their skill will appear Theocles to the princess. Everyone will do his utmost to gain the prize of this chariot race. But to tell you the truth, I care little for the victory, since your heart is not to be contended for. For my part, madam, you are the only prize I propose to myself everywhere. It is you whom I imagine to be the reward in these combats of skill. I aspire honourably to gain this race only to obtain a degree of glory which may raise me nearer to your heart. As for me, madam, I do not go with any such thought. As I have all my life professed to love nothing, I take pains, but not with the same object as the other princes. I do not pretend to obtain your heart, and the honor of gaining the race is the sole advantage to which I aspire. Scene 5. The Princess, Aglanta, Cynthia, Phyllis, Moron. Whence proceeds thus unexpected haughtiness? Princesses, what do you say of this young prince? Did you observe what an air he assumed? It is true it was somewhat haughty. Moron, aside. Oh, what a fine trick he has played her. Do not think it would be pleasant to humble his pride and to abase a little that hectoring heart? As you are accustomed to receive nothing but homage and adoration from the whole world, such a compliment as his must indeed surprise you. Oh, I confess it has caused me some emotion, and I should much like to find a way to chastise this pride. I had no great desire to go to this race, but now I shall go on purpose, and do all I can to inspire him with love. Take care, madam, the enterprise is dangerous. 
and when one tries to inspire love one runs a risk of receiving it oh pray apprehend nothing come i shall answer for myself end of act two third interlude scene one moron phyllis phyllis stay here no let me follow the rest oh cruel creature if Tercis had asked you, you would have stayed fast enough. Oh, that may be. I own I love much better to be with him than with you, for he amuses me with his voice, and you deafen me with your cackle. When you sing as well as he does, I promise to listen to you. Oh, stay a little. I cannot. Pray do. No, I tell you. Moron holding phyllis i will not let you go <sighs> what a bother i only ask to be one instant with you well i shall stay provided you promise me one thing what not to speak at all oh phyllis if you do i shall not stay will you let me go well stay i shall not say a word take care you do not for at the first word i shall run be it so making some gestures ah oh, phyllis ah oh. scene two moron alone ah she runs away and i cannot overtake her that is the mischief if i could but sing i might do my business better most women nowadays are caught by the ear. That is the reason why everyone learns music. No one succeeds with them but with little songs and little verses that are warbled to them. I must learn to sing that I may act like others. Oh, here is the very man. Scene three, a satyr, moron. Satyr sings. La, la, la. Ah, friend Satyr, you know what you promised me ever so long ago? Pray teach me to sing. I will, but first listen to a song I have just made. Moron, aside and in a whisper. He is so used to sing that he cannot speak otherwise. Come, sing, I am listening to you. I was carrying a song do you say i was a song to be sung i was a lover's song hang it i was carrying in a cage two sparrows i had caught when young chloris in a dark grove showed to my astonished eyes her blooming and lovely countenance when I beheld her gaze, so skilled in conquering, I said to the sparrows, Alas, console yourselves, poor little animals. He who caught you is much more caught than you are. Moron was not satisfied with this song, though he thought it very pretty. He asked for one with more passion in it, and, begging the satyr to sing him, the one he had heard him sing some days before, the satyr thus continued. In your song so sweet, sing to my fair one. O oh, birds, sing all my mortal pain. But if the cruel maid gets angry when she hears, the true story of the pangs I endure for her sake, then birds be silent. This second song, having moved Moron very much, he desires the satyr to teach him to sing it. Ah, this is fine. Teach it me. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. Fa, 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 fa. Fa yourself. 
the satyr gets angry and by degrees places himself in an attitude as if he was coming to fisticuffs. The violins begin to play and several satyrs dance an agreeable entree. Act Three, Argument In the meantime, the Princess of Ellis was very uneasy. The Prince of Ithaca had gained the prize at the races. Afterwards, the Princess had sung and danced in an admirable manner, and yet it did not seem that these gifts of nature and art had been even observed by the Prince of Ithaca. She complains of it to the Princess, her relative. She also speaks of it to Moron, who calls that unfeeling Prince a brute. At last, seeing him herself, she cannot refrain from making some serious allusions to it. He candidly answers that he loves nothing except his liberty and the pleasures of solitude and the chase in which he delights. Scene 1. The Princess, Aglanta, Cynthia, Phyllis. It is true, madam, that this young prince showed uncommon skill, and that his bearing was surprising. He is the conqueror in this race, but I doubt much if he leaves with the same spirit with which he came, for you aimed such blows at him that it was difficult to defend himself, and without mentioning anything else, your graceful dancing and the sweetness of your voice had charms to-day to touch the most insensible. There he comes, conversing with Moron. We shall know what he is talking of. Let us not interrupt them, but turn this way to meet them again by and by. Scene 2. Euryalus, Arbates, Moron. Ah, Moron, I confess I was enchanted. Never have so many charms together met my eyes and ears. She is in truth adorable at all times, but she was at that moment more so than ever. New charms enhanced her beauty. Never was her face adorned with more lively colors, nor were her eyes armed with swifter or more piercing shafts. The sweetness of her voice showed itself in the perfectly charming air which she deigned to sing, and the marvelous tones she uttered went to the very depth of my soul, and held all my senses so enraptured that they could not recover. She then showed an agility altogether divine. Her lovely feet upon the enamel of the soft turf traced such delightful steps as put me quite beside myself, and bound me by irresistible bonds to the easy and accurate motion with which her whole body followed those harmonious strains. In short, never did soul feel stronger emotions than mine. More than twenty times have I thought to give up my resolution, cast myself at her feet, and declare to her frankly the ardor which I felt for her. Take my advice, Lord, and be careful how you do that. You have discovered the best method in the world, and I am greatly deceived if it does not succeed. Women are animals of a whimsical nature. We spoil them by our tenderness, and I verily believe we should see them run after us, were it not for the respect and submission whereby men allure them. My lord, here comes the princess, a little in advance of her retinue. At least continue as you have begun. I shall go and see what she will say to me. In the meantime... Walk you in these alleys without showing any desire to join her, and if you do accost her, stay as little with her as you can. Scene 3. The Princess, Moron. You are intimate, Moron, with the Prince of Ithaca? Ah, madam, we have known one another a long time. What is the reason that he did not walk so far as this, but turned the other way when he saw me? He is a whimsical fellow, and only loves to converse with his own thoughts. Were you present just now when he paid me that compliment? Yes, madam, I was, and thought it rather impertinent, under favour of his princeship. For my part, I confess, Moron, this avoidance of me offends me. I have a great desire to make him fall in love with me, that I may bring down his pride a little. Upon my word, madam, you would not do ill. 
he deserves it. But to tell you the truth, I have grave doubts of your success. How so? How? Why, he is the proudest little rogue you ever saw. He thinks no one in the world is like him, and that the earth is not worthy to bear him. But has he not yet spoken of me? He? No. Did he say nothing to you of my singing and dancing? Not the least word. This contempt is shocking. I cannot bear this strange haughtiness which esteems nothing. He neither esteems nor loves anyone but himself. There is nothing I would not do to humble him as he deserves. We have no marble in our mountains harder or more insensible than he. There he comes. Do you see how he passes without noticing you? Pray, Moron, go and tell him I am here, and oblige him to come and speak to me. Scene 4. The Princess, Euryalus, Abates, Moron. Moron, going up to Euryalus and whispering to him, My lord, I tell you everything is going on well. The princess wishes you to come and speak to her but take care to continue to play your part. For fear of forgetting it, do not stay long with her. You are very solitary, my lord, and it is an extraordinary disposition of yours to renounce our sex in this manner and to avoid at your age that gallantry upon which your equals pride themselves. This disposition, madam, is not so extraordinary, but that we may find examples of it at no great distance. You cannot condemn the resolution I have taken of never loving anything without also condemning your own sentiments. There is a great difference. That which becomes well our sex does not well become yours. It is noble for a woman to be insensible and to keep her heart free from the flames of love. But what is a virtue in her is a crime in a man, and as beauty is the portion of our sex, you cannot refrain from loving us without depriving us of the homage which is our due, and committing an offence which we ought all to resent. I do not see, madam, that those who will not love should take any interest in offences of this kind. That is no reason, my lord, for although we will not love, yet we are always glad to be loved. For my part, I am not of that mood, and as I design to love none, I should be sorry to be beloved. Why so? Because we are under an obligation to those who love us, and I should be sorry to be ungrateful. So that to avoid ingratitude you would love the one who loved you? I, madam? Not at all. I say I should be sorry to be ungrateful but I would sooner be so than be amorous. Perhaps such a person might love you that your heart... No, madam. Nothing is capable of touching my heart. Liberty is the sole mistress whom I adore. And though heaven should employ its utmost care to form a perfect beauty, in whom should be combined the most marvelous gifts both of body and mind, in short, though it should expose to my view a miracle of wit, cleverness, and beauty, and that person should love me with all the tenderness imaginable, I confess frankly to you, I should not love her. Princess, aside. Was ever anything seen like this? Moron to the princess. Plague take the little brute. I have a great mind to give him a slap in the face. Princess, aside. This pride confounds me. I am so vexed that I am beside myself. Moron, in a whisper to the prince. Courage, my lord. Everything goes as well as can be. Euryalus to Moron. Ah, Moron, I am exhausted. I have made strange efforts. Princess to Euryalus. You must be very unfeeling indeed to talk as you do. Heaven has not made me of another disposition. But, madam, I interrupt your walk, and my respect ought to inform me that you love solitude. Scene 5. The Princess Moron He is not inferior to you, madam, in hardness of heart. I would willingly give all I possess in the world to triumph over him. 
I believe you. Could you not serve me, Moron, in such a design? You know well, madam, that I am wholly at your service. Speak of me to him in your conversation. Cunningly praise my charms and my lofty birth. Try to shake his resolution by encouraging him to hope. I give you leave to say all you think fit, to try to make him in love with me. Leave it to me. It is a thing I have set my heart on. I ardently wish he may love me. It is true the little rascal is well made. He has a good appearance, a good countenance, and I believe would suit very well a certain young princess. You may expect anything from me, if you can but find means to inflame his heart for me. Nothing is impossible. But, madam, if he should come to love you, pray, what would you do? Oh, then I would take delight in fully triumphing over his vanity. I would punish his disdain by my coldness, and practice on him all the cruelties I could imagine. Well, he will never yield. Ah, Moron, we must make him yield. No, he will not. I know him. My labor will be in vain. We must, however, try everything, and prove if his soul be entirely insensible. Come, I will speak to him, and follow an idea which has just come into my head. End of Act Three Fourth Interlude Scene one, Phyllis and Tursis. Come, Tursis, let them go, and depict to me your sufferings in the manner you know. Your eyes have spoken to me for a long time, but I should be more glad to hear your voice. Alas, you listen to my sad complaints, but, O oh, matchless fair one, I am not the better for it. I make an impression on your ears, but not on your heart. Well, well, it is something to touch the ear. Time will produce the rest. Meanwhile, sing me some little ditty that you have made for me. Scene 2. Moron. Phyllis. Tursus. Oh, have I caught you, cruel one? You slink away from the company? To listen to my rival? Yes, I slink away for that reason. I repeat it to you. I find a pleasure in his company. We hearken willingly to lovers when they complain so agreeably as he does. Why do you not sing like him? I should then take a delight in listening to you. If I cannot sing, I can do other things. And when? Be silent. I wish to hear him. Tursis, say what you like. Ah, oh, cruel one. Silence, I say, or I shall get angry. Ye tufted trees and ye enameled meads, that beauty winter stripped you of is restored to you by spring. You resume all your charm. But alas, my soul cannot resume the joy that it has lost. Zounds, why cannot I sing? Oh, stepmotherly nature, why did you not give me the means of singing like any other? Really, Tersis, nothing can be more agreeable, and you bear away the bell from all your rivals. But why can I not sing? Have I not a stomach, a throat, and a tongue, as well as any other man? Yes, yes, come on then. I too will sing and show you that love enables one to do all things. Here is a song I made for you. <laughs> come, sing it then. I shall listen to you for the novelty of the thing. Pluck up your courage, moron. There is nothing like boldness. Your extreme severity cruelly wounds my heart. Ah, Phyllis, I am dying. 
deign to lend me some assistance. Will you be the stouter for it because you have allowed me to die? Well said, moron. Mm, that is very well. But, moron, I should like very much the glory of having some lover die for me. It is an advantage I have not yet enjoyed. I find I should love with all my heart a person who would love me sufficiently to kill himself. You would love the person that would kill himself for you? Yes. That is the only thing to please you? I. <sighs> it is done, then. I will show you that I can kill myself when I have a mind to it. Oh, how pleasant it is to die for the object one loves. Moron to Tersis. It is a pleasure you may have when you like. Take courage, moron, quickly die like a generous lover. Moron to Tersis. Pray. Mind your own business, and let me kill myself as I like. Come, I will shame all lovers. To Phyllis. Behold, I am not a man who makes many compliments. Do you see this dagger? Pray, observe how I shall pierce my heart. Laughing at Tersis. I am your servant. I am not such a fool as I look. <laughs> Come, Tersis, repeat to me in an echo what you have sung. Act 4. Argument The Princess of Ellis, hoping by a stratagem to discover the sentiments of the Prince of Ithaca, confides to him that she loves the Prince of Messina. Instead of seeming concerned at it, he gives her tit-for-tat and tells her that he is enamoured of the Princess, her relative, and that he will demand her in marriage of the King, her father. At this unexpected news, the Princess of Alice loses all firmness, and although she tries to restrain herself before him, yet as soon as he is gone, she so earnestly entreats her cousin not to listen favourably to this prince, and never to marry him, that she cannot refuse. The princess complains even to Moron, who, having freely told her that it was a sign she loved the Prince of Ithaca, is driven from her presence on account of his remark. Scene 1. The Princess, Euryalus, Moron Prince, as hitherto we have shown a conformity of sentiment, and heaven seems to have imbued us both with the same affection for liberty and the same aversion to love, I am glad to open my heart to you, and to entrust you with the secret of a change which will surprise you. I have always looked upon marriage as a frightful thing, and have vowed rather to abandon life than to resolve ever to lose that liberty of which I was so fond. But now, one moment has dispersed all these resolutions. The merit of a certain prince has today become obvious to me. My soul suddenly, as it were by a miracle, has become sensible to that passion which I have always despised. I presently found reasons to authorize this change. I may attribute it to my willingness to satisfy the eager solicitations of a father and the wishes of a whole kingdom. But, to tell you the truth, I dread the judgment you may pass upon me, and would fain know whether or not you will condemn my design of taking a husband. You may make such a choice, madam, that I should certainly approve of it. Whom do you think, in your opinion, I intend to choose? If I were in your heart, I could tell you. But as I am not, I do not care to answer you. Guess. Name someone. I am too much afraid of making a mistake. But for whom would you wish that I should declare myself? I know well, to tell you the truth, for whom I could wish it. But before I explain myself... I must know your thoughts. Well, Prince, I will disclose it to you. 
I am sure you will approve of my choice, and to hold you no longer in suspense, the Prince of Messena is he whose merit has made me love him. Euryalus aside. Oh, heavens! Princess aside to Moron. My invention has succeeded, Moron. He is disturbed. Moron to the princess. Good, madam. To the prince. Take courage, my lord. To the princess. He is hit hard. To the prince. Do not be disheartened. Princess to Euryalus. Do you not think that I am in the right and that the prince possesses very great merit? Moron aside to the prince. Recover yourself and answer. How comes it, prince, that you do not say a word and seem thunderstruck? I am so, indeed, and I wonder, madam, that heaven could form two souls so alike in everything as ours, two souls in which are seen the greatest conformity of sentiment, which have shown at the same time a resolution to brave the power of love, and which in the same instant have shown an equal facility in losing the character of insensibility. For in short, madam, since your example authorizes me, I shall not scruple to tell you that love this very day has mastered my heart and that one of the princesses, your cousins, the amiable and beautiful Aglanta, has overthrown with a glance all my proud projects. I am overjoyed, madam, that we cannot reproach each other, as we are equally defeated. I do not doubt that, as I praise your choice greatly, you shall also approve mine. This miracle must become apparent to all the world, and we ought not to delay making ourselves both happy. For my part, madam, I solicit your influence, so that I may obtain her I desire. You will not object that I go immediately to ask her hand of the prince, your father. Moron aside to Euryalus. Ah, worthy heart, ah, brave spirit. Scene two, the princess Moron. Ah, Moron, I am undone. This unexpected blow absolutely triumphs over all my firmness. It is a surprising blow, it is true. I thought at first that your stratagem had taken effect. Ah, oh, this vexation is enough to drive me mad. Another has the advantage of subduing a heart which I wished to conquer. Scene three, the princess, Aglanta, Moron. Princess, I have one thing to beg of you which you absolutely must grant me. The prince of Ithaca loves you and designs to ask your hand of the prince, my father. The prince of Ithaca, madam? Yes, he has just now told me so himself and asked my consent to obtain your hand but I conjure you to reject this proposal and not lend an ear to what he may say. But, madam, if it be true that this prince really loves me, and as you have yourself no design to gain his affections, why will you not suffer? No, Aglanta, I desire it of you. I beg you to gratify me so far, and, as I have not the advantage of subduing his heart, let me have the pleasure of depriving him of the joy of obtaining yours. Madam, I must obey you, but I should think the conquest of such a heart no contemptible victory. No, no, he shall not have the pleasure of braving me entirely. Scene 4. The Princess, Aristomenes, Aglanta, Moron. Madam, at your feet I come to thank love for my happy fate, and to testify to you by my transports, how grateful I am for the surprising goodness with which you deign to favour the most humble of your captives. How? The Prince of Ithaca, madam, just now assured me that, with regard to that celebrated choice which all Greece awaits, your heart had been kind enough to declare itself in my favour. He told you that he had it from my mouth? Yes, madam. He is thoughtless, and you are a little too credulous, Prince, to believe so hastily what he told you. Such news, in my opinion, should have been doubted for some time, and you could have done no more than believe it, if I myself had told it you. Madam, if I have been too ready in persuading myself, 
pray my lord let us break off this conversation and if you will oblige me let me enjoy a moment's solitude scene five the princess aglanta moron oh, with what strange severity heaven uses me in this adventure at least princess remember the request i have made to you i have already told you madam that you shall be obeyed scene six the princess moron but madam if he loved you you would not have him and yet you will not let him be another's it is just like the dog in a manger no i cannot bear that he should be happy with another if such a thing is to be i believe i shall die with vexation come madam confess all you would fain have him for yourself and in all your actions it is easily seen that you rather love this young prince i i love him oh heavens i love him have you the insolence to pronounce those words out of my sight impudent man and never let me see you again madam be gone i say or i shall make you leave in another manner moron aside upon my word her heart is no longer free and the princess casts a look upon him which sends him away scene seven the princess alone what unknown emotion do i feel in my heart what secret uneasiness suddenly disturbs the tranquillity of my soul is it not what i have just been told and do i love this young prince without knowing it ah if it were so i should be in despair but it is impossible it should be so and i plainly perceive that i can never love him what i be capable of that baseness i have seen the whole world at my feet with the utmost insensibility respect homage submission could never touch my soul and shall haughtiness and disdain triumph over it i have despised all those who have loved me and shall i love the only one who despises me no no i know well i do not love him there is no reason for it but if this is not love which i now feel what can it be and whence comes this poison which runs through all my veins and will not let me rest out of my heart whatever you may be you enemy who lurk there attack me openly and appear before me as the most frightful monster of all our forests so that with my darts and javelins i will rid myself of you End of Act Four. Fifth Interlude. Scene One: The Princess Alone. Oh, you admirable ones, who by your sweet songs can calm the greatest uneasiness, draw near, I pray you, and try to soothe with your music the sorrow which I feel. Scene Two: The Princess Clemen Phyllis. Clemen and Phyllis sing this duet. Tell me, dear Phyllis, what think you of love? Tell me, what think you, my dear trusty friend? They say its flame is worse than vultures gnawing, and that great pangs are suffered when one loves. They say no fairer passion ever existed, and that we live not if we do not love. Which of us two shall be victorious here? Must we believe love to be good or ill? Let's love, and then we'll know what we ought to believe. Chloris praises love and its flames everywhere. For its sake, Amaran sheds always tears. If it fills every heart with so much pain, whence comes it that we like to yield to it? If, Phyllis, its flame is so full of charms, why forbid us its pleasures to enjoy? Which of us two shall be victorious here? Must we believe love to be good or ill? Let's, Let's love, love, and, and then, then we'll, we'll know what, what we, we ought, ought to believe. believe. Princess, interrupting them here, says, Finish alone, if you like. I cannot remain at rest, and however agreeable your songs are, they do but redouble my uneasiness. 
Act Five. Argument. The heart of the Prince of Messina was agitated by various feelings. The joy which the Prince of Ithaca had caused by maliciously informing him that he was beloved by the Princess had compelled him to go to her with a want of consideration which nothing but extreme love could excuse. But he was received in a manner very different from what he hoped for. She asked him who had told him the news, and when she knew that it was the Prince of Ithaca, that knowledge cruelly increased her disease, and made her nearly beside herself. She replied, He is thoughtless. This so confounded the Prince of Messina that he departed without being able to answer. On the other hand, the princess went to the king, her father, who came with the prince of Ithaca, and told the latter not only how delighted he should be to see him allied to him, but even the opinion he entertained that his daughter did not hate him. No sooner was the princess in her father's presence than, casting herself at his feet, she asked him, as the greatest favour she could ever receive, that the prince of Ithaca might not marry the princess Aglanta. This he solemnly promised her, but he told her that if she did not wish him to belong to another, she should take him herself. She answered that the prince did not desire it, but in such a passionate manner that it was easy to see the sentiments of her heart. Then the prince, abandoning all disguise, avowed his love for her, and the stratagem which, knowing her disposition, he had made use of, in order to attain the object he had now reached. The princess giving him her hand, the king turned towards the two princes of Messina and Pylos, and asked them if his two relatives, whose merit was equal to their rank, were incapable of consoling them in their disgrace. They answered that, the honour of his alliance being all they wished for, they could not expect a happier lot. This occasioned so great a joy in the court that it spread over the whole neighbourhood. Scene 1 Iphitas, Euryalus, Aglanta, Cynthia, Moron. Moron to Iphitas. Yes, my lord, it is no jest. I am what they call in disgrace. I was forced to pack up my traps as quickly as I could. You never saw anyone more suddenly in a passion than she was. Iphitas to Euryalus. Ah, oh, prince. How grateful I ought to be for your amorous stratagem, if it has found the secret of touching her heart. Whatever, my lord, you may have been told, I dare not, for my part, yet flatter myself with that sweet hope. But if it is not too presumptuous in me to aspire to the honor of your alliance, if my person and dominions... Prince, let us not enter upon these compliments. I find in you all that a father could desire, and if you have gained the heart of my daughter, you want nothing more. Scene 2. The Princess, Iphitas, Euryalus, Aglanta, Cynthia, Moron. Oh, heaven! What do I see here? Iphitas to Euryalus. Yes. The honour of your alliance is of the highest value to me, and without any further difficulty I consent to your request. Princess to Iphitas My lord, I throw myself at your feet to beg a favour of you. You have always shown great tenderness to me. I owe you much more for your kindness than for my birth. But if ever you had any affection for me, I now ask the greatest proof of it which you can show. My lord, do not listen to that prince's request, and do not permit the princess Aglanta to marry him. And why, daughter, would you oppose that union? Because I hate the prince, and will, if I can, cross his designs. You hate him, daughter? Yes. From my heart I confess it. And what has he done to you? He has despised me. And how? He did not consider me handsome enough to pay his addresses to me. What offence does that give you? You will accept no one's hand. No matter. 
he ought to have loved me like the rest and at least have left me the glory of refusing him his love for Aglanta is an insult to me. He disgraces me when, in my presence and in the midst of your court, he has sought the hand of any other but me. But what interest can you have in him? My lord, I wish to revenge myself for his disdain. And as I know he is very much in love with Aglanta, with your permission I shall prevent him from being happy with her then you take this to heart without doubt my lord and if he obtains his desires i shall die before your eyes come come daughter make a frank confession this prince's merit has made you open your eyes and in short you love him say what you will i my lord yes you love him i love him say you do you impute such baseness to me oh heavens how great is my misfortune can i hear these words and live and must i be so unhappy as to be suspected of loving him oh if it were any one but you my lord who spoke thus to me i know not what i should do well well you do not love him you hate him i grant and i am resolved to content you so that he shall not wed the princess aglanta oh my lord you give me life but to prevent his ever being hers you must take him for yourself you are joking my lord and that is not what he desires pardon me madam i am rash enough to aspire so high and i take to witness the prince your father if it was not your hand i asked of him i have deceived you too long i must throw off the mask and though you use it against me discover to your eyes the real sentiments of my heart i have never loved any one but you and never shall i love any other it is you madam who took from me that want of feeling which I always affected. All I said to you was only a feint which I adopted, inspired by some secret motive which I did not follow up without doing the greatest violence to my feelings. It must soon have ceased, no doubt, and I am only astonished that it lasted for half a day. For I was dying, my soul was burning within me, when I disguised my sentiments to you. Never did a heart suffer a constraint equal to mine. If this faint, madam, has given you offense, I am ready to die to avenge you. You have only to speak, and my hand will immediately glory in executing the decree you pronounce. No, no, prince, I do not take it ill that you have deceived me, and would rather that all you have said to me were a faint than not the truth so that you accept the prince for a husband my daughter my lord i do not yet know what i shall do pray give me time to think of it and spare a little the confusion i am in prince you may guess the meaning of this and you can now see what you may expect i shall wait as long as you please madam for this decree of my destiny and if it condemns me to death, I shall obey without murmuring. Come, Moron, this is a day of peace, and I restore you to favor with the princess. My lord, I shall be a better courtier for the future, and shall take very good care not to say what I think. Scene 3 Aristomenes, Theocles, Iphitas, the Princess, Aglanta, Cynthia, Moron. Iphitas, to the Princes of Messina and Pylos. I am afraid, Princes, that my daughter's choice is not in your favour. But there are two Princesses who may console you for this trifling misfortune. My lord, we have made up our minds. And if these amiable princesses have not too great contempt for hearts which have been repulsed, 
we may, through them, attain to the honour of your alliance. Scene the last, Iphitas, the princess, Aglanta, Cynthia, Phyllis, Euryalus, Aristomenes, Theocles, Moron. Phyllis to Iphitas. My lord, the goddess Venus has proclaimed everywhere the change in the princess's heart. All the shepherds and two shepherdesses testify their joy for it by dances and songs, and, if it is not a spectacle which you despise, you may see the public rejoicings extend as far as this. Sixth interlude. A chorus of shepherds and shepherdesses who dance. Four shepherds and two shepherdesses, dressed in heroic style, and holding each other's hands, sing this song to which the rest answer. Proud fair employ in better way the power of charming all. Love, Love, darling, darling rustic, rustic maidens, our hearts are made to love. However much we e'er may try, one day comes when we love. Not does exist, but yet it yields to these sweet charms of love. In pristine youth, O oh, follow the ardent love's delight. A heart only begins to live. The day it knows to love. However much we e'er may try, one day comes when we love. End of Acts 5 and 6. End of Princess of Alice by Moliere. Translated by Henri van Laun.